Did I have a hand up? Yeah, please. Oh, go ahead. Oh, oh sorry. Uh, somebody's going to run to you with a mic. Thank you. I know that my local council is strapped on cash. Yes. So what will be the two easy steps to tell them to do in order to get data on order? But even more than strapped on cash, their personnel has no idea about data as well. Yeah. So what will be like two or three steps that you would recommend from all of this work to tell my counselors when I see them in a surgery, for example? Yeah, great question. Um, so on the strap for cash, we do, through the Blueprint Coalition, obviously recommend increased funding for local government, but also um, funding for local government to become less complicated. At the moment, they have to bid for tiny different sets, pots of money, and it's really hard. The, the money problem is a big one. Um, but on that, the report that CEUK have released is really good for outlining some steps that councils can take to increase their climate action that don't cost any money. And one that Don mentioned is um, making sure that you have a climate portfolio holder, like somebody whose job it is to do climate and is responsible for that. Um, and so, you know, there's steps there that you can think about. Um, the, the second point was, sorry, yeah, about data. Um, I think that it's a tricky one, as you say, personnel. In the report, we go into quite a lot of detail about how uh, I think previous iterations of civic tech have asked for really like, complicated data standards because they're right, ideal but hard for um, councils to implement. And so I think basics publishing you know, is kind of key. Alex, I don't know if you have any more thoughts on this as someone who wrote the report. Um, I've got one maybe oh, sorry, answer to a bit Serena of this. Um, I think one of the things we're trying to do with the Local Intelligence Hub is uh, trying to provide the tools for civil society, citizens, local climate groups to have those conversations with officers and with councillors. I think you're right. In some councils, they're really far ahead and they're totally on top of this. They collect the data, they turn up to Climate Emergency UK's consultation events, everything. There's many who don't and they're already council officers drowning under loads of obligations already. Like, how do you, how do you help them? I think, to some extent, that's about citizens and community groups getting involved and saying, hey, like, have you noticed this thing? Have you seen these examples of other councils that can do this really well? H how about you, we're running uh, climate hustings, why don't you come along to it? Uh, we're running this thing for the Great Big Green Week, why don't you come along to that? Um, I think there's opportunities for people outside the council to help. And whenever we talk to people within the councils, they more often than not happy to hear, f hear about this. Um, they, the the councillors in particular love hearing from their constituents and the officers too. Um, and as long as it's an informed and um, uh, friendly <laughs> dialogue, um, which can be difficult sometimes to maintain, I think that's, that's another way that doesn't cost councils any money. In fact, it could save them money by making sure that the, the plans they're coming up with and the actions they're taking are sort of have already got support from a groundswell of, of the constituents. And on the data point, I think my understanding is that um, Westminster Council, it's either Westminster or Kensington, um, their submission to the scorecards, they just publish openly on their website. Like part of this is you could just be publishing more of what you are strapping openly for people to see what they can do with it. Um, great. Uh, got another question, I think. Sorry, I'm just answering. Hi, um, I totally agree that the audiencing for this has to be civil society, but I'm, I'm, this, I'm thinking about from working on the inside of these organizations, if you have a portfolio holder for environment, that doesn't actually mean that they do any of the actual work that is involved in reducing carbon emissions. And I'm, I'm thinking about this in uh, the most boring terms possible of procurement, because the thing that you, the, the main way I presume that councils can actually reduce their, their carbon is, you know, buying things that have a, a smaller carbon trade. Have you worked at all with, I, I, mean, I think Open Opportunities had a thing going on with like, the carbon stuff, because like, this is all great for pressuring, but I'm imagining a council worker sitting in a finance team who has to do a procurement exercise, who has no idea how to make the right decision on this stuff when there is some open data available. So have you explored a reconfiguring some of these things to be a tool for people trying to make the right choices inside local government rather than just piling on the pressure from outside? Yeah, um, as I mentioned, 
our first prototyping week was looking at basically exactly this. So how can we give officers inside of local authorities more support to do the right thing, to procure the right thing, or to notice or provide some sort of leverage against these big providers who do a good job generally, but like names like Veolia and whatever that have these multiple year, multi-million pound contracts, like there's, there's a very limited window where you've got an opportunity to change that for the next five years. So what can we do around that? So we prototyped a thing that maybe could help both local, originally we thought it was gonna be for campaigners outside of councils to be like monitoring in a very my society way, like I wanna spy on what my representatives are doing, send me an email alert when a new procurement contract comes up. And we tested it and we talked to council officers and they were like, oh my God, this is amazing. Like, I had no idea that these contracts are being signed and written by my colleagues in another part of the council. And I, as the climate officer, like if I could see that, I would just go and talk to them. Like I'll find them at lunch and say, you shouldn't be procuring this thing. Like there's loads of other options. So I think in some cases, you're totally right. Like trying to expose that data to the people within the councils. Councils are big, ungainly organizations. It's often difficult for them to know one hand to know what the other hand's doing. So um, yeah, th that um, we called it contract countdown. Um, so that you could see like what was what was about to come up for renewal so you could get in early um, and we're, we're trying to find support for that at the moment um, I'm looking at our finance uh, <laughs> fundraising person um, it'd, be, it'd be really great to test it out and build it uh, we did we worked with um, spend network um, who had been doing some really interesting work trying to estimate the um, the carbon footprint of contracts and terms within contracts and uh, we'd worked with the Open Contracting Partnership as well. Obviously, they've got lots of data and we'd scraped um, all the live UK contracts finder data into that. Um, so I think the data is probably there. It's a bit difficult to work with and it'd be really interesting to see, dare I mention, I don't want to cross the streams of today, but dare I mention the word AI. Like it'd be really interesting to try and um, categorize uh, like, so what sorts of contracts look like contracts that there's rich pickings there for making them more climate friendly? That feels like the sort of thing that machine learning could really help with. Um, yeah, I just wanted to ask on the add-ons to scorecards. We didn't create it for the whole purpose of council, council officers who are leading on climate action. They are useful to anyone working in a council to understand how they contribute to climate action. Uh, so amongst the 91 actions there is, does your council have a sustainable procurement policy? So anyone working on procurement could uh, go on this question page and find out examples of sustainable procurement policies from council all across the, the UK, all listed in one place. Um, and the same goes for um, any of the, of the council departments which are remotely um, in related to climate action. Um, we have a question, for example, on pension divestments, and we are in touch with um, council finance departments who are then, who have to implement those decisions when the motion is passed that the council wants to divest from, from fossil fuel. Um, this, this is then passed on to finance for implementation. So the, we want the scorecards to be used um, by everyone within the council, not, not just the, the climate leads, for sure. Um, I don't know whether there's any more questions here, but I, I wanted to switch to the Slido. So there's two here that have been upvoted, both for you, Don. Um, one, how do you keep the scorecards up to date? So we, we are not a climate action tracker in the sense that we can't update the score uh, manually all the time. Uh, we are going to be doing this again. Uh, we, we're starting, we're in the process of starting this now. We're recruiting for volunteers, and we're going to be scoring councils once again over the summer, uh, updating their scores for each one of the questions. Uh, there's more questions this time around, and there's more councils to score. Uh, and the results will be, will be published uh, in summer 2025, around June. Um, uh, because it takes a whole year to update the scores because of the three stages process. Um, and last time, 75% of councils uh, did the right of reply. Um, so we're hoping to get the similar number this time around to make sure that the scores are as accurate as they can be. Um, yeah. um, and the second question was, uh, 
how did the consultation process change the scorecards and was there a, a payoff in greater acceptance of the results? Um, yeah. Um, def definitely, I think the um, Campaigner Seek is a unique position where we try to be talking both to campaigners who are hugely supportive of the scorecards, but would like them to be even more critical of councils, but we also want to work in good intelligence with council themselves. Um, so this is why for each of the sections, we've held round tables and we've invited random selections of council from across the UK to give us their opinions on existing questions as well as new questions um, to make sure that they were all uh, reasonable and within the, the council's uh, powers and that we set the criteria at a reasonable level uh, because we do, we do want to have instructions and for the scorecards to be used by and respected by the councils. I think um, and currently one, one, in, one in five councils in the UK reference the scorecards or has issued a public statement about them, uh, which shows the level of interest um, and how respected the data is. Um, just because I was lucky enough to be part of the steering group um, on the roundtables, I think quite a nice example of that is that um, somebody from the TUC brought a proposal for a brand new question about um, does the council recognise a, a union um, in terms of um, in influencing the council's climate action plan, um, which I think, you know, there's loads of trade union movement going on in the, in the UK at the moment about this, and so it's really great to have that um, uh, introduced, but then we had feedback from council leaders that that could be considered really political, and could we change the wording to be um, a trade union organisation or another representative body within the council that allows employers to feed in, and then I think that that was a really nice example of people from like, you know, quite across the campaigner, um, trade union, uh, council employee spectrum, like coming together, and we ended up with a question everybody agreed on that will add a lot to the next round of scorecards, I think. Uh, cool. Um, next question, <laughs> I guess that's for me. Who's using the local intelligence hub and for what? Um, I think all sorts of things, uh, especially right now, there's been a lot of interest, obviously, in the new um, constituency areas. Um, I think as over the last year or so, as we've been talking to um, climate campaign groups and organizations, we've been like asking, because we were trying to work out when do we put the effort into launching these new area boundaries? And uh, Alex, uh, our head of research, was particularly um, uh, worrying about like, these boundaries haven't even been become official yet <laughs> for a very long time. Like, we don't have identifiers for them, which is like such a, a proper geeky thing to say. Um, so we were trying to work out like, how do we help? It goes back to that question about like the skills and the data skills that, that are out there. Like, when are the council, uh, when are the, the campaign groups, when are the charities, etc., going to start using these new constituencies? And I think we've seen basically it was <laughs> as soon as Parliament dissolves, they're all now finally thinking about like what's happening at that constituency level, who are the PPCs standing there, and when I'm talking to my local con um, uh, PPCs, uh, prospective parliamentary candidates at hustings or whatever. Like, what can I say to them about the scale and the ambition for climate action in our local area? And so we've seen people using the new constituency pages over the last couple of weeks especially to look at things like the movement data. And I should say, because I don't think we've mentioned them so far, the Climate Coalition and the people we're running the, the local intelligence hub with. And they've been amazing in getting their member organizations to share data about their local membership numbers, their supporter numbers, uh, where the local groups are, um, and you, you never think about like, oh, there's, there's like loads of women's institute groups all over the place, and the, the WI is one of the organizations who've, who've signed the Climate Coalition's pledge and who are really interested in getting their members, who are not your normal climate activist members, to talk to people like their MPs and their prospective parliamentary candidates about what are you doing to save wildlife in our area or protect the chalk rivers or, or whatever, the beavers. Um, so I think we've seen lots of use of that kind of stuff, as well as we're hoping over time there'll be a bit more use from inside the establishment too. Like we've seen some, some examples of PPCs and councillors using it themselves to get a bit of a feel for what, do what are people in my area likely to think 
Um, so stuff like the, the MRP polling has helped with that. Yeah, absolutely. I think obviously my answer would be I think everybody should use the local intelligence hub. I think that there's information out there for everyone. Um, I am especially interested at the moment, as Irina was just saying, obviously we've got an upcoming election. How can this be useful to new MPs to understand their um, constituencies, MPs representing new constituencies? Um, if you haven't looked at it yet, there's so much data in there, as Serena says, about polling, but all sorts of other yeah, demographic factors about the constituencies, and they have just changed. Um, the other thing that we haven't mentioned is that there is the map view where you can zoom out rather than looking at an individual constituency, and you can look at the country as a whole and build maps where you, know, you can plot different data sets, um, both shading to see what's there to begin with, and you can color it in different ways. Um, and as someone who just isn't a data expert, or certainly wasn't before I came to my society, I think that that is a really helpful feature for the movement. If you're doing planning for a national campaign and you want to work out where to allocate your resource and you're not sure, um, you can look at where the hotspots of certain kinds of um, uh, action or indeed deprivation are to be able to allocate your resource effectively. Um, so I think it's really good and more people should use it. Um, next question. Uh, are there any questions in the room before I go back to Sligo? Giving you a chance. Oh, there is one. Here we go. This might be like on the fringe of the topic, but it, as a private company, one of the hardest things with these types of data sets is like the licenses from OS and the costs of Royal Mail. Um, have you given any thought of that to like, uh, like you know, almost like, uh, stripping that information and publishing that because then it makes it more usable by uh, other people. I know the UPRNs now are like, that obviously is very, very useful because it takes away the Royal Mail part, but um, so it's okay if we want to skip it, but uh, that's been a huge barrier for us, for example, because it means any product we make has to make profit in some way because otherwise we're stuck uh, at a loss. And so, yeah interested in that. I think two things come to mind here, but I'm sure Julia and others might have comments. Um, one is that we talk about things like uh, CAPE and the scorecards and local intelligence hub, which are like the fancy front ends, but actually lots of the work that our climate team does is producing data sets that other people then go on to use. So I know because we get a feed in our, in our Slack of whenever anybody downloads one of our data sets. Um, and uh, things like our, we've just got a really simple data set that just maps between a bunch of different identifiers for local authorities and uh, constituencies maybe, but local authorities at least. Um, and so uh, people being able to use that, you sort of see that a lot. Um, but also, the second thing I'll mention is that uh, one of the, things that you can do on the on CAPE um, is compare with other councils that are like the council you're looking at. And we kind of based that, we would have loved to have used the SIPFA nearest neighbor kind of thing, but that's like some proprietary closed data set that they use, but it's what all the councils use to compare themselves with other councils like them. Um, and we wanted to use that, we couldn't, and we were like, we're going to build our own. And so we like came up with, with like, at least there is now uh, our kind of council similarity index, which uses a bunch of different kind of um, uh, factors, environmental factors, size, population, uh, urban, rural mix, things like that, that kind of come as a good-ish approximation of similarity. And we've tested that and got feedback on that. And people find that generally useful. So I think another alternative is if you can't, through policy means or through campaigning or whatever, manage to get OS or Royal Mail or whoever to open up these data sets, maybe there's an opportunity that the rest of us can come together and back an open alternative to those. I don't know whether you've got anything else yeah, to add. Yeah, I agree. It is one of our policy positions to open up the postcode draft file and make that free. So it should be. Okay. Yeah. I um, agree with everything Zarino said. Um, somebody's asked, uh, how would you decide which prototype to potentially turn into a fully functioning tool? Um, I wish I could say this is a really simple answer, and it is, it is more uh, an art than a science, I think. Um, so we, just to, to summarize, so in that final day of the prototyping week, we've obviously taken the prototype and had about a half hour conversation with about 
five to ten kind of representative users or specialists in that field and got their ideas on what would work and what wouldn't. And I think, I don't know whether there's any kind of user researchers in the, rule, but my, in the room, but my general rule of thumb is like, once you've started hearing the same thing from like three or four people, there's a chance that that's probably the right answer. Um, and uh, you'd, you'd often find by the end of the day, lots of people have picked up, oh yeah, th this is totally cool, like I would totally use this, but only if you changed it in this particular way, or how, have you thought about trying this particular thing? And you sort of hear that coming through again and again, you're like, oh, there's probably something here. Whereas there was other weeks where we built this prototype, and you'll, you'll see this if you read our prototyping reports, it was a bit like, well, people were sort of, yeah, that was nice, but like they wouldn't go on and use it, and that was like a sign we'd hit a dead end, and maybe we should go back to a previous stage in the prototyping process, go back to the Nero board with the other ideas and try something else, because I think we've just hit something that there's just not enough interest there or energy around that to take it forward. I think another thing is, I kind of came up with this kind of uh, layout of like, um, between us as a team, we were going through a number of questions, and one of them was like, how my society is this tool? Like, how kind of pirate is it? How kind of like punk is it? Um, like, how well does it fit our organization or the skills we've got? But also like, the, do we see this as the kind of tool that my society would run? Because it feels like if you're gonna make a go of it, it has to suit your organization. And it is, it is, you're sort of making yourself a little bit vulnerable in these prototyping weeks of like asking people, what should we do? Where should we go with this? And they can, if you're not careful, it can sort of drag you off course. And it's, it's always a bit of a tension as to like, oh, there's something here, and maybe if we built that, that would work. But like, are we the right people to take that forward or are other organizations? And you can, you can kind of cover that by partnering with the other organizations in some way, if you can both bring something to it. But also, you've just got to be ready to sort of give that idea out to the public and say, like, here's all the research we did, here's the prototype, go ahead and use that. Um, and we're happy to help people or advise, but if not, have fun with it. Um, there's another question of what did we do next for each one, but I think I've kind of mentioned that. Um, there's a question here, uh, what's next for CEUK? Will there be another round of scorecards? Yeah, um, so I've started answering that, and something else I wanted to mention is that, uh, so we're all talking about the general elections happening soon, but we also just had a local election in May, uh, where about a third of councils had uh, elections to replace councillors. Um, so what CUK decided to do is to offer free training to anyone who is newly elected uh, in the local election, and we are currently training 45 uh, newly elected council office, um, councillors uh, on how to use the scorecards as a prioritization exercise and how to effectively become a champion of climate action uh, during their current mandate. And we're planning to uh, host these trainings again. Uh, we're going to be um, training our, our volunteers. We, we're not just training them to score councils. We're also uh, holding what we call the policy program, which is six sessions uh, which speakers from uh, the, the sector um, to, to show them um, everything that is possible to do at the local level on climate action. Um, and we will be hosting this uh, training again in the future for our campaigners as well. Could I be extremely cheeky yeah. and piggyback on this question? Um, just for people in the room who might be interested, because today you've heard about the scorecards, which is crowdsourced information using Grace, which is the crowdsourcing software that we build. And we're in the democracy stream, um, just working on a new project called Who Funds Them, which is actually sim following a lot of the same principles and structure as the scorecards, because I think as my society, we've learned a lot from it. Um, and yeah, if you were in the session with Alex yesterday, you'll have heard about it, but maybe you haven't. Who Funds Them is looking at the register of members' financial interests and also all party parliamentary groups. And um, we'll be using volunteers to help us crowdsource data about those. And so the register of financial interests tells you that your MP has accepted three grand from J. K. PLC, and you don't know what that is. And so we're using volunteers to help us go through and work out who those companies actually are, categorize them, give more information, give context that is then in a searchable way. And one thing in particular that we took away from the scorecards is the right of reply process, which we find, you know, which adds a lot of legitimacy, I think. So we, in, in the scorecards, we go to councils and say, this is what our volunteers have found out about you. Is this accurate? Do you agree? 
And then, as uh, Don said, 75% replied to that process and said, yes, here, no, here, so-and-so. And in the Who Funds Them project, we'll be doing the same thing. We'll be going to MPs and saying, this is what we found out about you. You know, what do you have to say about this? Um, so, sorry, I know that's extremely cheeky piggyback of that, but I thought it might be interesting to people in the room. Well, you've sort of answered one of the next questions, uh, which was from Chris of, most of these tools are using council collected and published data. Do you have any plans for community data collection and aggregation? Um, which that's an example yeah. of. Also things like, um, what do they know? Which is our freedom of information site. One of the tools that Climate Emergency UK has used on there is uh, what do they know projects, which is a way that um, community organizations, uh, community news media in particular, uh, journalism, community journalism can get their supporters to uh, extract information from batch freedom of information requests, which is another way of like getting multiple people to get the data out uh, and process it and then hand it basically to the journalist to be able mm -hmm. to say, here is a nice clean data set for you to write a, a story about. Um, and so we use that in the, the climate emergency scorecards for, I don't know, how, how many FOI questions were there? It was like about 10-ish, something. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I think it, it, we've been exploring other uses for that outside of climate as well. Like, can can um, members or supporters of an organisation like come along and use what do they know Pro to extract that data out? Um, but yeah, I think it is it is a bit of a challenge coordinating that kind of work um, and getting that community data uh, clean and reliable and trustworthy, but. Um, organizations especially I should I should mention them because they're right in front of me democracy club do an amazing job of this um, uh, crowdsourcing all of the information that frankly the government and Parliament and the Electoral Commission should be producing themselves um, but we need to show them how to do it properly obviously so good on you <laughs> um, just one more on that about um, yeah community data collection one thing that we get asked a lot for the local intelligence hub is um, contact information and more information about community groups, which there is a huge data need for, and I think is, you know, it, it makes sense. You're somebody, and maybe you just moved to a new area, or whatever it might be, you want to get involved in climate action, and you want to find out who your local groups are, how to get in touch with them. Um, and so people have asked us, can't you just be the place where people tell you that we're a community group, here's our Facebook page, put it on the local intelligence hub, bish bash bosh. And um, we wish we could, but the trouble is there's 650 constituencies, you know, dozens of climate groups in each one, they change their name, they change their Facebook page, like all of this stuff happens. Um, so that there's a really interesting need there for that kind of resource, but how, how can we be the people to do that? Um, yeah, we don't have a good answer to that yet, but if anyone else does, let us know. <laughs> That'd be good. Yeah. Uh, and there was a question here, which was, how did you find each other to partner up? I think that was timed basically around the time I was talking about Climate Emergency UK. Um, and I, this actually predated me. So I uh, wrote uh, on our staff WhatsApp um, to uh, Louise Crow, our CEO, to say, how did we first find Climate Emergency UK? Um, and the answer was that... Uh, Louise's local XR group was trying to engage with the council on their plans, and that made us think about, like, ah, so you could, like, talk to your council about what they're planning to do after their, their emergency declaration, which seems so obvious now in retrospect. Um, and, uh, yeah, we found Kevin's website, uh, Kevin Freer, who, who was the founder of Climate Emergency UK, and basically wrote him a fan email saying, we love the data you're collecting here. This must be really hard to maintain and keep up to date. And there's probably so many cool things we could do with the data and basically got in touch with them. And it was a similar thing with the Climate Coalition. Um, they, we, we'd been running these prototyping uh, weeks. Um, we had the one on access to nature. One of, the, mem one of the, the, the members of a steering committee at the Climate Coalition came along to that and said, said back to the TCC, there's this little charity called My Society, you might know them, they run things like They Work For You and Fix My Street, and they seem to be doing really cool stuff around climate, like you should talk to them, they know about data, they could help us with our movement work, our, our sort of campaigning and, and strategy work, like talk to them. So I think it's basically just being, not being afraid of sending a fan email to other organizations that you think are too busy and won't talk to you, because actually like there's opportunity there for you to collaborate on something. Um, and 
yeah, those are two examples of us having done that and it kind of paid off. Um, uh, yeah, I don't know whether that answers the question as to how did we find each other, but um, I, think I think we are at time, so I should probably call it. Um, thank you so much for all of your questions and thank you to Julia and Don as well for telling us a round of applause, please.